All right, welcome back to the shop. Maybe you are peering in as we get ready here for another adventure in Epic Woodworking Shop Night Live. <laughs> welcome to Canterbury, New Hampshire, to the workshop here in our backyard, about a good 150 feet behind the house, and in a barn-like structure with lots of windows, as you can see. But uh, it's, been, it's been a pretty wild week, actually practicing the worst thing I do in life, and that is getting organized. So uh, <laughs> you do it well. <laughs> I've been cleaning up. You'll notice the place is a little cleaner, not, not for any um, article or anything, for you and uh, for visitors coming soon. So we're excited about that. But tonight, we're going to talk about the magic of a curved element, specifically with a bow front uh, apron on a table. So this is a, a topic that I didn't really get into putting curves into work. Well, I have, I have to say, um, I did with my time at Pug. We did make a bow front chest of drawers. That was my first real adventure in, uh, in that world. But we are, um, since moving up to North, up to New England, to, to Canterbury, New Hampshire, I've gone kind of crazy in, in curved elements on work. So I want to start getting into that more and more. We haven't done a whole lot. We've been doing more fundamental pieces, but uh, throw a little mix of that in. So tonight I want to show you just a technique, just a kind of tease of what's coming as far as elements on projects. And it has to do with the curved apron of a bow front table. Let's just look at this right down here. So here's just a simple example. Um, this table may look familiar. Some of you may have even taken a class on this because I have used it in the past as a course here. Um, if you look at the back, it's just like our hall table or end table. Very kind of simplified um, shaker, tapered leg appearance, cherry table. But then instead of just a straight front, we throw you a curve. <laughs> Lots of dust on the top. No, no. Yeah, yeah, sorry. That's the shop life. I did clean it earlier. I'm sure you did. <laughs> so it's like our house. <laughs> yeah, I know. So this is how um, how it looks when you get a curved line. I I know I put in my little post on Instagram. If you're not following us on Instagram, it's Tom McLaughlin ten. But I posted uh, today about this, and oh, in the email as well, the quote by Jerry Osgood that a straight line is a missed opportunity. Now, of course, straight lines have their place. In fact, if everything was curved it's kind of almost disturbing, right? Because you need a place to kind of get your bearings and, and rest your eyes. Sometimes people go crazy with pieces and they look like jelly, like there's no spine or structure to them. So it's not bad when you have a curved elements to have some straight elements, which I always try to do and not go too nuts. But to throw a curve in there and uh, it makes a world of difference. Some of you took that course recently where we did the um, modern writing desk. That was really a nice exploration into slight curves and what a difference it can make. Pillowed surfaces, so surfaces not flat but actually subtly curved. Yet we had a nice framework that was linear and kind of gave a nice complement and a place to rest your eyes. But tonight I wanna just go through the process of making the a curved element like this. So let me show you what this one looks like underneath. It's got, it's different, of course. It's, it's actually different from the other three rails in that it's laminated and I used a bending ply in there and I also have a uh, three layers here, two layers of 5 16ths to 3 eighths it is, and then 
a an eighth inch layer in the middle and it looks like I put an eighth inch layer in the front here the one I'm going to show you I'm just going to put one in the middle the multiple layers add more glue layers obviously and once you have that those number of glue layers in order for it to move out of the curve that you laminated into all those glue layers have to fail kind of equally they all have to slip for the curve to relax and come back so that's why laminated curves are more reliable as far as getting more precisely the curve you're after than say steam bending um, steam bending is a is a great way of working but it doesn't always give you the most predictable results so we're going to get into laminating on this one and uh, anyway so I want to first show you the laminating process and we'll zip through that and then I want to show you another one that is old school and we'll have some fun with this because I'm going to revisit some techniques I haven't done for quite a while but are really enjoyable so uh, let's let's look at this material here I've got to make that apron you can see it consists of these layers so it is I'm, I'm doing it with the bending ply so this you can buy it a lot of um, hardwood dealers or plywood dealers have this um, just chat in if, if you find that this is available at your hardwood or ply uh, dealer you know can you get bending ply fairly easily um, it used to be that I could only find it at more of the um, you know specialty plywood places but I hope that's something that's available um, so that's what we have a sandwich here basically of five layers um, where we've got the bending ply now um, I won't go into the bending ply a lot but you can see just how it's it's just got really no resistance in this direction however in the other direction it's quite rigid like I'm just going across like a three and a quarter inch piece here because all the grain of the top and bottom layer is running in this direction here which is a very small kind of uh, a thin piece of veneer basically in the middle going the other way so it gets a real flopsy kind of uh, material but it makes it super easy to bend and it keeps the form quite well so on the outside we're going to sandwich this I'm actually not going to do this one but this is I'm going to do a little shorter one so we uh, don't have to use this big long one this is actually long enough to accommodate one of those uh, bow front tables if by the way if that's a kind of project you'd like to see in the future chat that in too because I'm curious if that's one that would be interesting I do think of it sometimes like building it a little larger and putting the leather inserts so it would um, have a desk appeal as well maybe with leather or without you know you'd have a cherry frame with leather insert writing desk again even though nobody writes anymore does <laughs> anybody anybody's typing away right no more writing <laughs> all right so Maybe we can bring it back yeah let's bring it back so that's kind of the layup in the build up here now let's say you don't want to see the plywood so sure at the end when you're done your lamination and your curve you or before you put on the outer the pieces you can clean that edge and glue on a piece of solid stock of course thicker than this but you glue it on you'd first trace it out so it'd be solid but it would be sawn to the curve so you could glue that on and then you could clean up to the the uh, core curve and then in a second trip put on your outer piece so that requires basically two laminations because you you take that second one to get that piece on uh, and then cap it and what that does is it fools the eye more because it's really hard to tell is this solid or is this 
is this real? You saw that out? Well, no. One of the nice things about, and the reasons for laminating a curve like this, if you did try to saw a curve out of solid wood, what happens is, if this was sawn out of a solid piece, as you get around the bend there, you start to expose more and more end grain. So, <laughs> let me try to manipulate this. All right, there we go. So, as it's curved around, you're going to be seeing more end grain, which is darker in appearance. So you have this kind of, you'd have a lighter color here, and then you'd have a darker kind of end grain look as you made it around the corner. And that would be true on both sides. And that kind of doesn't show the best of the material on a curve. So you want to have that continuous material going around. But there is another way. It's more costly and a little more time consuming as well, where you make your own laminations out of the same material. So you could sequentially cut your laminations, like let's say, let's say we had these layers here. Now these are only about a sixteenth of an inch, but you could make laminations a little heavier than that, up to about an eighth of an inch, and then it starts to get a little too uh, resistant to the bend. But you're going to laminate those and then glue them up, and after they're glued up, Especially if you keep them in sequence, you won't be able to tell that it was actually cut apart at all. So let me just show you a piece. Here's a, uh, a drawer front to a cherry piece. And that is what I just showed you. You can see on the end how many pieces there are. Well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's uh, nine, ten layers there. So 10 layers and we're not, so those must be a 16th because that looks like about 5 eighths. So look at that. It's, it looks like a solid piece of cherry, but it's all laminated. And these were, I believe, these might have been sequentially cut, but I'm pretty sure what I did here was I purchased it from a veneer uh, source and they had a special section called um, thicker? <laughs> what the heck is it? Thicker veneer. <laughs> no. Specialty thicknesses. That's what they call it. In fact, you can check those out at Certainly Wood. Um, I haven't talked to them for a long time, so this is not like a plug or anything for sponsorship or anything. I've just used them for a long time. And since Berkshire Veneer went out of business, they're the only ones in the game for me right now, but you can go on it certainly would and you can look at their supplies and you'll see an area called specialty thicknesses and they'll sell different veneers more than just the standard 42nd of an inch thick, which is quite thin. And you can find some that are heavier, like more than a 16th, but a 10th of an inch thick. And some of it is not as pricey because it's not super fancy, but you could build a core, laminate your core out of solid material and wow, you've got a solid looking drawer front when you pull open the drawer. So I'm not sure why I didn't use this. It's, uh, I think I did an experiment or something, but I got that out of the library upstairs. <laughs> so we've got that. The treasure chest. Yeah. And one other thing about making a nice job of a bow front table like that is when you get your veneer, whether you saw it out yourself and then run it through a drum sander, which is what I usually do, if you do that, you can, you can control the quality and the appearance of the material so that it will it'll be really nice in the front. But what about those side pieces? What I like to do is make sure I've got a really harmonious look. So those side pieces, like here's an example. You can see, let's, let's give me one that you can see better. So this is a side piece. It was just a piece, almost quarter sawn, but riff sawn cherry. See that sap wood there? But what I did was I laminated a piece of the same uh, special thickness veneer that I used on my front bow onto the side so that as it wrapped around it almost looked like you know you had a really nice harmony 
between the bow and the material on the side. And this is one, of, this is small enough that you don't need to veneer both sides. And it's quite thick. You know, you've got this solid wood that's just three inches wide. And I've got it at least, at least three quarter, maybe 13, 16 inches thick. And then I laminate the 16th of an inch on front. And it's beautiful. I mean, it's still straight and everything. And this has been glued up for several years. Um, also from the library. And here's uh, another piece. Same, same thing. There's actually a laminated piece on there. So that's one of those little things that you can do to control the material and get a really beautiful looking table so that it appears that the color wraps around. Let's just take a quick look at this one and see if that's what the case. Yeah, so see how that bow front color is? And then as you come around the side, that's the same extra thick veneer over whatever cherry I have. So no one would know, but you get a nice job of it. And then if you get all the legs from the same stock, that's just one of those things that helps to enhance the final appearance of your, your table. All right. So let's just uh, get organized with one of these. And I'm gonna set these longer pieces aside for a second. You don't need that anymore. And what we're gonna do is bend this around a form. Now, forms are sometimes con time consuming to build because you wanna get that accurate curvature that you're, you planned out. So a lot of times I'll draw these out full size and even scribe an arc. Uh, for this table, the arc is basically it's 50 inches. So if you look at uh, this, this uh, MDF portion, it's 50 inches to there. And then on top of my form, I added three quarters of an inch of masonite. And that this is kind of an overkill form. I realized when I, early days of form building, like this was a while back, I kind of overkilled on them, you can see. But it's, it's reassuring to put the masonite on there because there's, there's spines in here. So there's the same, the same shape of that MDF right there is right at this point in here and here. So you have three spines in the middle and then on the outside. The reason I put those extra on there is because I'm using this form inside of a vacuum press. So I would just laminate all my, my layers and then stick it into the vacuum press. Let me get that. Like this, you know, with, you could put several in at one time and it goes in the press and the suction comes down and there you go. Can't do this in the, uh, the raw rocket bag unless you've got a big <laughs> enough bag. But this, I was going to set up my press today, but I decided not to do that thing. It's kind of noisy and uh, it, would just, it would be impressive to watch it suck down. But one of these days I'll show you on another project. But, so this would go in, suck down in the press, and after... After an hour, you could pull it out. Now, um, so the reason I overbuilt it is I was a little anxious because I had seen these uh, examples of forms crushing, getting crushed inside a vacuum press because it's so much pressure. You know, it's 144, no, sorry, 1,400 something pounds pressure no, that's not right either. <laughs> no, it's, it's 14 pounds pressure per square inch. Is that right? Somebody get me straight on this. Yeah, I think that's what it is. So if you add that up, it's a crazy, it's, it's over 1,000, almost 2,000 pounds per square foot. So there were some examples of, of some forms that were made. The spines weren't close enough together and the, the covering material deflected and got like wavy and some even broke. So 
you could have a, even a deflection so that if you put a wider piece on here, in the pressure of the vacuum, it would actually come out with this undulating waviness to it. But that gets all eliminated when you totally overkill build your form. <laughs> no, that gets over, oh, eliminated when you put about a half an inch of masonite on there. So two pieces a quarter inch, sometimes just one piece will do it, um, depending on you know, how far apart your, your spines are. But there you go. I just wanted to talk about that form. So that takes some time to build, but you get it pretty accurately built, and then it can laminate and go right in the bag. It's kind of fun. Throw it in the oven, and no more worries. I've got a question about sure. the um, form. How did you create the even arc before cutting it out? Oh, great question. I, um, I actually put it on a, put my router on a pivot arm and I just attached the router and the pivot point was say 50 inches away from the cutter. So I'm going to leave a 50 inch arc. So I'll do that into a piece of um, like quarter inch masonite usually. I had that original here, but I didn't. Uh, so that gets cut, and then I then I rip some sample pieces that are about the width I want, and then it uh, then I trace those on that arc, and I usually put stops for the thickness of the height, and once and then I'll use that arc as the router template to make all my spines, so they come out dead even and I have them indexing off a stop so they're all right at the right point and you get a nice true arc across. When I'm in a hurry uh, and it's not so precise, I'll just draw that arc and I'll saw it out and I won't even worry about, um, you know, uh, routing to it to be flush about it, you know. You could just clean it up, clamp them all up, clean it up by sanding or whatever, and then once you put your, your uh, top material on, like this masonite, that'll just kind of cancel out any slight variations. So there you go. Hope that explains it So enough. the uh, comment is 14.7 PSI pressure. Thank you. That's good info. Per square inch. So if you multiply that by 144, that's your pressure in a square foot. So that's got to be right around 2,000 pounds. 2,160 pounds pressure on one square in a foot. Sorry. Wow. So think about that. That's, that's a lot so. of pressure. Lots of mathematicians out here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, Dean's curious um, if the Shakers ever did curved forms like that or curved bow fronts. That's a good question, Dean. I don't think so. I don't recall seeing any um, bow front chests or any even tables, but I could be wrong on that. Um, you know, the only thing I can think of with where they push the curved line a little, of course, round tables, pedestals, but they also had those sweet um, trestle tables where they had the arched legs on the base little feet that went out but uh not a lot of curved lines shaker there. boxes lupe saying yeah right. shaker boxes sure um that's that's how did i not even think of that so richard's saying uh asking is there a set measurement for the arc or is there a set arc for say the bow front table yeah that's that's a good question because it's it's kind of it has to do with the width of the piece or the length of the piece because uh, I'm trying to find a pleasing arc that's not too weak but not overdoing it either. So if you carried this arc on a six foot long table, say, it would be way too big. You know, it'd be like sticking out in the room and someone would go, hey, what'd you have a bad day? <laughs> Laying out your arc? Well, you know, so this is too strong for a longer table. But uh, for a short table like that, I wanted to see it enough and have it accentuated enough where it worked. So um, actually that arc from this point over, if you had a zero here, it protrudes um, 
I think it's two and seven eighths. So the straight line from front, it's, which isn't a terrible, a huge amount on a long table. Um, like, man, I'm trying to think what the general, I don't have a general rule, honestly. I built both front sideboards, desks, but they, when they get closer to six feet long, I'm thinking more about a four inch bow, five to six feet long, I'm thinking, but I'm always kind of eyeballing it to see if it looks too much or not enough. So if you're gonna put the bow there, you wanna see it, you want it to be a strong enough element, but not crazy, like, so hope that answers your question. I would go, you know, close to three inches for a shorter table like this three inches in the amount of bow. So this is uh, a 38 and a half, say a 40 inch table would be a three inch bow. And then, um, but we'll go from there. This is fairly strong, you know, you wouldn't want to have this on a longer table. Is that it? Um, I do have a question from Dennis. Uh, this may, he says, be on top, not on topic, but how do you attach a curved apron to your legs, mortise and tenon? Uh, is it a square ten tension cut on a curved apron, arc apron? Um, oh, yeah, I'll show you that right at the end, Dennis. That's a, that's a great question. I will go over that right after we show the glue up. But, okay, yeah. did you say how thick that masonite is, Ken's asking? Carrie's asking, sorry. Yeah, overall it's three quarter, but I was looking at it. I have two layers of eighth inch. I probably put those on and thought, oh, that's not going to be enough. And, and then I got two layers of a quarter inch because the quarter is hard. It gets hard to bend it down, but I'm sure I rolled the glue, tacked it with some brads here and there, and then stuck it in the vacuum press. So it actually got pressed down. And that became the perfect I mean it's really a true arc definitely um, enough but usually it's about a half an inch added on if you got the masonite like two layers of quarter inch would be gracious plenty and if your spines are closer together you could even do maybe even get away with one but you'd have to check it one way to check it is once you have your form made you can stick it into your vacuum press with nothing on it turn on your vacuum and then you can put a straight edge. You're gonna have, it's gonna be sucked down right directly here. Put on your straight edge. And if you see it like wavy like that, you need more <laughs> of a base, okay? Tom, can you lift it up? Show us the underside. <clears throat> yeah, that's the, uh, I've got screws in there. And this one, I didn't cut any. Usually it's a good idea to cut air breather holes so that when the vacuum goes, it's not forever weeping, like pulling air out of the form. You got your pump kicking on. And uh, so it also has to do with the um, pressure. This right? thing is old, huh? Yeah, it's been around a little while. So I've got quite a few of those upstairs of all different <laughs> styles and sizes. They're pretty heavy. So I started building them a little lighter using smarter techniques there but I'm gonna leave that right there and here's the one what we're gonna glue up just a quick example these this will be my model and I'm gonna arrange the layers in this order so I've got my my 16th inch thick cherry then a piece of uh, 3 8 bending ply which actually ends up being closer to uh, five sixteenths and then an eighth inch bending ply another layer of full and then our um, outside piece now I usually want to look these aren't the greatest pieces of veneer but I'm going to choose one for the outside do I want to have the circle yeah why not let's go with the circle instead of just straight that'll be the outside actually I cut this one longer I'm going to go with this on the outside you need the long, if you're a little longer, you want that on the outside because as it bends, you get shorter on the outside. So let me get a little glue and we're going to head over to the, the other table that's cleared off for change. And uh, look at all that space. I know. 
I don't know what I'm doing. It's like I took all that stuff and I moved it over there. <laughs> <laughs> I threw it in the closet before you got here. All right. So we just get a little glue in the... I'm going to use Type Bond 3 now. Um, you can get away with Type Bond 3 in a pen like this, but when I'm laminating like that solid wood, um, or you really need a reliable to know it's going to keep that form, I will use um, urea formaldehyde glue, like Unibond. Gosh, what is that? Unibond, actually Unibond now has a Unibond 1 glue that's um, not a true urea formaldehyde glue, but I usually get that from veneer pressing systems. And uh, that's good stuff. That When that dries, it doesn't dry with any kind of elasticity. It dries almost like a hard shell almost a glass if you think of glass so it um it's really great for laminating when you when you know you want you want to keep that lamination dead on but i, th I don't expect this will move and even if it did no worries I usually start with a little more on the first one because it's got to wait longer. All right, let's just keep it rolling. Maurice was just saying he was looking at a book and all of a sudden a picture of he popped up. <laughs> it's the workshop's book. Oh, Remember geez. that? Scott Gibson's book? That was a few years ago. That was... Oh, my gosh, yeah. 2000 something, early 2000, like 2000. Yeah, what was that called? The workshop book? I think it's just called works, Workshop. The Workshop book, uh, yeah. I'm saying Unibond 800. Yeah, Unibond 800 is one. And then they, but they started with, they've got another one called Something One. I was on that site not too long ago. Um, Daniel's asking how many ribs did you use? How far apart was it? Five? Yeah, I've got five and they're about three inches apart. Usually I go for about three. So center to center. These are like three and almost, the middle ones are three. Yeah, yeah, so they're, these are like three inches on center. <coughs> okay, flip. I don't have to be so precise about this, but I do want to give you the example, since this is really a bend for nothing. <laughs> This is why my shop has gotten just full up with good stuff. <laughs> with I just classroom. can't I just can't throw it out. You know? Samples, demos, Unibond 1L. Ron's asking. Yeah, I think that might be it, Ron. Yeah. I forget what it is. Also Unibond 1, Rich says. Yeah. yeah, that's the stuff. I think that's like um, I shouldn't have talked about it without being fresh in my mind, but um, someone can explain the characteristics or what is the selling point of U Unibond 1. I forget what it was. Do you have any thoughts on this question from Ken? When it, is it okay to use tight bond versus Unibond 800? I thought tight bond would creep. Yeah, um, that's what I was trying to make the point of. Tight bond will cure and it can creep, but it takes a lot for it to do it and uh, what I was saying is when you do a bend like this you have a lot of glue surface and every one of these layers has to would have to fail in essence to creep all at, all at the same time that's a lot of surface area for all these layers so in a lot of cases it's not a problem but if there's if it's a bend like a super, you know, if it's solid wood and I want it to definitely maintain that curve for some kind of engineering reason in the piece, I will absolutely go with Unibond um, 800 or a complementary 
There's others too. There's one called Vacbon 2000. 2000? Why am I having the suffixes? <laughs> but that's from Quality Vacuum. And that's a powder that you just mix with water. Where the Unibond is a two-parter that, um, that has like a shelf life of a year. The other stuff lasts a little longer. All right, so now I've got to put a call on this. Um, now, there's a lot of ways. Like this, I could tack this or to the, the form. And sometimes I'll just, I'll just put some tape on at each end and hold it down that way until it gets into the bag. And it's a good idea when you have a piece like this that doesn't slip all around when the clamps are going on or, and you can just wrap it with a little tape. See how it's kind of greasy and uh, make a sandwich like that. And these, as this bends, these ends are going to slip. So, I but I could tape them. It's just the tape will slide when you go. Now, if it goes in the form under the vacuum press, I'd also want to put a call on top, and that'll that'll give you that nice even pressure, almost like a board that's clamped between. You know, so you get that good, strong, even pressure across the whole surface. Uh, the call will distribute that pressure better than just the, bla the bag itself. But here, we're going to go with just clamping it to the form. So this is a kind of a quick way of going about it if you want to. And you don't, you can just use your calls. Now I'm going to use two pieces of quarter inch MDF. Uh, so that's giving me a half inch of a call. The reason I want to go more than just one is I'm going to put clamps on this. And if you put clamps on, believe it or not, if you have a thin enough call, the clamps will telegraph pressure through. And you're going to get a waviness or a dip everywhere you had a clamp. You wonder how I know that? <laughs> I've had that go wrong on some earlier projects some years ago. I can't even remember what happened on but... It's not, it wasn't pleasant. So I learned the hard way, you know, that you need more of that. So I'm also going to put a piece of wood there. And let's just use basic clamps here. This will distribute the pressure across the piece. I'm not going super hard here. I'm just going to try to pin it in the middle. Tom, while you're doing that, can you remind us what you're laminating together other than the cherry outer pieces, Dennis is asking? Yeah, I've got um, a core of two pieces of uh, 3 8 bending ply in this separated by one piece of eighth inch bending ply. And then on the bottom, the inside, is another piece of the um, special thickness veneer, 16th of an inch. Thing. So I think we're answering Tom's question. He says, could extreme clamping overcome the absence of a vacuum press? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm doing. I'm kind of skipping the vacuum press. Oh, I'm getting a slippage. Um, Tom, Ron's asking, how important is glue color to lamination? Do you use different tints depending on the wood? Um, on the edges, yeah, you might see something, um, but I don't, I don't ever worry about that because you're not going to see it on the edges. Um, Usually they're covered or hidden. And some of the, the glues like dry darker. If you have a darker glue that, and you are gluing up like a, a brown glue, you know, like a really darker tinted glue, and it was, you were laminating maple, then I would shift over to a lighter color glue there. But the vast majority of time, I'm not even worrying about it. But, see, this wants to slide a little, so I don't know if this is going to... I never actually do this, obviously. <laughs> Sometimes you don't have to state the obvious, right? It's sort of like if you get up to give a speech and you're not prepared, you don't need to tell anybody. You don't have to say, I'm not prepared, because they're going to know <laughs> one way or the other. 
<laughs> so me saying, I've never done this. I haven't done this in a while. It's coming out great. All right, so I'm going to come down here, and hopefully it won't slip this time. I'm going to start this clamp a little bit. Let's just push it down and get one started on the Joseph other Joseph is, is curious, is there something on the surface of the form to keep any squeeze out from gluing the lamination to the form? Uh, usually I do wax the form, but Joe, but because this is a, uh, because it's a sixteenth of an inch piece of veneer, I'm not going to get any squeeze through there. So I didn't worry about it in this case. All right. Don't try this at home. I'm not happy with how this is sliding. But the good thing is you always, um, all these pieces are oversized. So actually that's pretty good. I'm over length and, but it is sliding off center a little bit. But let's just pretend that everything was hunky-dory. It is pretty good, but it's not perfect. I got a little misalignment of the veneer on the bottom down there, but that's it. I just wanted to show you, that's one thing you can do. Now, a more predictable way to work on a form, an easier, much easier way, which I've shown a few different areas or projects in the past, is using an inside and outside form. So this has a, let's see, I got the whole story on here. This is like a 43, 43 and a quarter radius here. And this is for the rockers on the rocking, the craftsman style rocking chair. So you have like an inch space in there. And these are cut with different patterns. And when you put that material in there with two single um, eighth inch calls on each side, it, so that difference in there is exactly an inch and a quarter. So you put that clamp on the middle and you just go to the other end. You'd only need a few clamps. Like you can clamp this whole arc with like six clamps is plenty. Because the, the uh, actual call here distributes the pressure beautifully. It's like three inches wide. But because it's made of a core of plywood, it's super rigid and it doesn't bend at all. And it does a beautiful job of clamping up laminations like that. <coughs> so my, <coughs> excuse me, my preferred method is this or putting it in the vacuum press. A, a strong curve like this is not practical to go into the vacuum press over a form like this because it's just too much of a form. It ends up being way too high. So you'd want to put it around a form like this. There is another way to use a vacuum bag that I haven't shown you yet that is actually has the form outside the bag. So the piece is inside the bag and you get the pressure started and then you bend the bag around the form. So uh, that's kind of fun to do, but those, form, those bags tend to be narrower. So just about 10 inches wide and long. So you can do that around the form. But that's another way of going about it. And you can see like, just to give you a quick example, this is not gonna fill up the full thing, but it would be, it's not gonna be a perfect curve here. But if you were gonna glue something like this in there, you just put on your piece and see how it just pulls the whole thing down super easy. Before you put your pressure, you can make sure everything's aligned nicely. And then go ahead, you could set a one in the middle and get them out on the ends and you'd be good to go. Whereas that method is kind of greasy and slick. One, one thing I would do here is I sometimes I'll actually pin it across the middle and if you have a, that opportunity to keep things from slipping around. But um, there you go. All right, so what I want to show you now is the old time method of creating a curve. And for this, you don't even need a form. And what we're going to do is often called bricking up the curve or um, it's sort of like bricklaying the core out of solid 
wood. And most commonly in the 18th century, especially the cords of bow front uh, drawer fronts, um, curved aprons on tables, they'd be thick. They were, the cores were white pine because white pine is really a stable substrate and it, so it doesn't go out of shape and also it's, it's lighter weight and it's easy to work. So that's what we're going to use tonight. I'm going to just kind of show you this. This is, you're probably saying, how are you starting a whole new thing with 15 minutes left? <laughs> well, <laughs> Because I'm ready. I'm ready. And I want to just show you as best I can. Uh, and yeah, it'll probably take a few more minutes than 15. But um, I'm not going to show you laying out the whole curve. But the, you have to create these segments like this that have the angle in it to assemble and make the curve you're after. We went over that on the Coopering, the, the Cooper door. Um, video we made just a few weeks ago, right? I showed laying out the curve and getting the correct angle for the length pieces. Depending on the length of piece you have and the curve, the angle here that you're going to cut on the end of your segment will be different. But if you want to see that method for figuring out that angle, go ahead and check out that Cooper Door uh, video. That actually was got a pretty popular. A lot of people a looking to Cooper doors. <laughs> oh, that was interesting. <laughs> that one's that one shot up there in view. So, um, anyway, what I want to do is just show you how I knocked out some of these pieces. I've got a bunch of them prepped. Let's just go to the table saw here. So. So you can see we've got our, I've got this table here and I've already got this angle on here. So I, I trued up one end, I made the cut and then I had this long stick and these pieces are about an inch and a quarter and it's just three quarter inch stock, but you can make these out of whatever thickness you want. You can build your bricks up out of thicker stock and it'll take less layers if that's the case. Um, but let me see here. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So these just have to be cut to length now. So what I've got here is a stop and I set that up so that this will be my temporary fence. This is the way you can use your crosscut sled to cut really dead on angle cuts on the end of your pieces. So this piece I just tacked to my sled. I tacked it at the appropriate angle that I wanted my miter to be on the end. I don't even know what the number is. I just went directly from the um, bevel, bevel gauge to make that. So I just take, once I cut that angle, which I did on the chop saw, I get that just right on the chop saw. Then I come over here for greater accuracy and I'll raise the blade and put that piece right flat against the blade with the blade up high and then I'll tack it right in and then I'll drop the blade and now I know that this angle is going to be perfect and I've got a great little fence here. So I can knock them right off. Here we go. I'll just cut these last few pieces to the proper length. Okay. All right, let's come on back over to our glue up bench. Oh, I gotta clean that up a little bit. I got some glue on the table. Get my beautiful bucket. It's so clean, ready to go. 
That can't ins- say as much about the rag, but we can. Inside say. joke, yeah. The bucket's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's not really dirty it's just like <laughs> I don't know I don't think of it as dirt it's kind of like glue residue alright so what I'm going to do is glue these up now end to end and this is kind of fun because it goes really fast and you don't need clamps at this stage you're just going to put a good amount on the end grain here and then you just bring them together and you get that kind of rub fit and just press them and you can almost feel it suction together then get another one same thing it's end grain so you got to have enough glue and it's not meant to hold the joint very long just enough to uh, get it assembled Okay, so I'm going to put a half piece. I cut one of these pieces in half. I'm going to put that on this end. Yeah, that's good. So I'll just squeeze that in. So I'm just going to go about the same length as our other demo piece. Hopefully that'll hold together. And now I'll do another one. And this time I'm going to have the half piece down the other end. So we'll get some goop on there. Again, I'm using Type 1 3. I haven't tried that new glue called Thick and Quick from Type Bond. Does anybody like that? Do you think that would be good for this application? Because it does grab very quickly, but whoops, I wonder if the viscosity is too much for, for this. I want this to hold better than that. <laughs> If you leave it alone and don't hit it, it will, uh, and you got enough glue on there. <laughs> this is going to be the night of failures. Let's, <laughs> let me uh, show you how not to do another thing. <laughs> All right, so let's go in here. It's about time. Yeah, right. <laughs> I go right on there. That'd be good. I, that could be my new whole thing. It wouldn't be hard to do either because you could just be normal. The Extreme Woodworker says quick and thick is fantastic. doesn't run all over the place. That's cool. How about something like this? Would it squeeze out? Would it, would it be too thick to the, the joint? Like you want a, these to pull together tight. Even though they're not going to be seen, you want them to be tight enough. So I do this. I would do this with four layers. And in this case, because I wanted to build it up to a three inch high um, piece. These, because this core is segmented, it actually gets a, um, a cap of solid wood, whether veneer or solid, um, on the top and bottom, so it's covered. Um, so like last week, if you did a cock beaded type drawer, you know, you could have that whole thickness of the cock beating on the top would be an eighth of an inch over the top of that could come in later but one of the things if you're using this method for drawer fronts like in using a darker wood like cherry I don't like it because I well I do do it but I do a special thing what happens is you have the dark wood front but you'll have the white pine coming out the end so your your dovetail pins are actually white wood you know and you're you look at the side of the drawer and you see you know mahogany or cherry and you see the pins and it's like they don't contrast that much with the side so what I often do is the last piece on the ends when I do these segments like a larger larger uh, drawer front will be the solid wood in the same type as the drawer so it'd be just cherry on the ends but the whole core is going to be this. So I've just been gabbing while this is setting up a little bit so we can... Yeah, Skip and Tom say they both use the quick and thick for segmenting, and they love it. Oh, cool. It's really good for yeah. that. And I was thinking about that while I was doing this. because squeeze out, Skip says. Yeah, because you're going to be waiting for this. So that's, that's good info. Um, that's a fairly new product, and I haven't tried it yet. I've got to get in touch with those guys. I'd gladly talk about it if you send me a few bottles. All right, here we go. I'm going to just run. Um, 
now some beads. Now I'd have four pieces here, so I'd put glue on three of the layers when you get to this phase, because now we're going to stack them up. And I got too much glue right in there. Let me just use this piece. And um, we stack them. And what it does is creates the offsetting because we have that half brick at each end or half segment. And we'll get like a reinforcing. So this will build like a, a core material that will be that will be nicely segmented and strong because all that offset strengthens the one above it, just like typical brick wall. So I'm just going to get it flush, like one quarter of the length along each one, if you're centered here, should be flush. So the quarter along, so then you're at the point here, and then you're offset fully here. But right here, you should feel it kind of flush if you're trying to line them up as good as you can. Quarter in. All right, that's pretty good. So then that would get tacky, and I would stack it up. I'd put four layers, staggering them just like that. So I'd get like a little brick wall. And then usually I'll take a, a flat, true jointed call material over the top and then over the bottom and let it tack up a little so you don't get any of that slipperiness there. If you know you're not going to go through the core, you can actually pin nail or, you know, use a brad nailer inside here where you know you're not going to be cutting into it. So that's another way you can keep it from slipping. But then you get on your clamps. And of course, I would have double the height here. Just gently. Question about your yep. um, glue bottle cap. Do you have it anywhere nearby? Yeah, I do. Thank you. Oh. There you go. There you go. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Mike. I was absent-minded as usual. <laughs> and then right there. You got your friends here. What right would now. I do? I mean, where are you guys all day? I mean, some. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> it's a mess. All right, so that'd be fully stacked, and there you go. So when you're doing a larger glue up or you want to have just larger call and just throw a few more clamps. If you're thicker, you don't need so many clamps, but that's it. You're going to create a beautiful brick laid material. So let me show you what I did a little earlier. And this is the actual full height. So because of that angle, um, I've got the curvature going there of my front. So let me get, hopefully this is the correct angle. Oh, remind me to, Talk about how that joins into the leg in a second. I'll, I'll, uh, you actually can see it on this one. I put floating tenons on these to join into the leg. Um, just find it works really well. But here we go. See, we've got our curvature pretty nice. And I'm going to just draw the curve. If you have plenty... So this I would have the template for the curved material. I'm going to go a little thinner. I have plenty material here. Looks like my angle was a little flat, but not too bad. Okay. So there we go. Now I've got the curve. Now I can just bandsaw the curve right there. And I've already got my core material. I didn't need to laminate anything. But you end up with a really super stable substrate with this method. This is old school. This is the old way of doing it. Of course, they didn't have a bandsaw to step to. They have to use a bow saw or something. But we're going to go to the bandsaw and cut this out. My remote control died, so I got another one ordered. I'm just going to cut this without dust collection, so... 
no worries. Here we go. Good smoking. Woo. All right. Can you see? Too smoky? No, I can't see the smoke. Uh oh. They can't see the smoke. <laughs> All right, let me just put this over here. Okay, so I'm going to come back to the bench. Man, that was uh, smoking a little. All right, so that's nice. Look at that. It's pretty sweet. Little brick laid, strong core. Now, I've got that curve, and it feels pretty smooth, but I'm going to clean it up really easily using a block plane and just let it skim over and take off the high points. Oh, I've got a three quarter, I believe it's a three tooth per inch, three quarter inch. This isn't set very strong. Let me, uh, it's going to be too heavy. I'll adjust this. Okay. Okay, there we go. Oh, such a pleasure to plane white pine. So, sometimes you look on the inside of a the apron on a table in the 18th century, and you will see this. They might be shorter, they might be a little thicker, but you will see a brick laid pattern. Because they would veneer a lot of times just the outside, because it, it was plenty strong. Just gonna get that curve nicely established. And that would be my outside curve. That feels pretty good. Pretty smooth. All right, so let's have a little more fun with it. And I'm gonna first just sand it a little. That's always fun. Still a little smoke hanging around here. So there's another beautiful thing about pine is how nicely it sands. It will gum up your paper, but that's why you have to make sure it doesn't clog. Usually I have a little scrub brush that helps with that. But that's sweet. I, now I'm really feeling that nice curve. And looks great but you're not gonna leave it like that you're gonna put a nice piece of veneer on there and like they did let's just let's say let's say we took a piece of Cuban mahogany huh this is really 18th century now so let's just get this about the right length here I'm gonna cut it right here Tom Lupe is asking, what technique would you use to clean the inside concave curve? I would use a, a Lupe, I would use a, um, a spoke shave. So I would put a, um, you could actually go right against the fence with this. So if you get your outside curve first, set your fence and you're just going to ride 
and get your curve to the thickness you want. And then I would spoke shave because this is a gentle curve. I would probably get away with a, a flat sole that short and be able to skim it that way. If not, I would have to have a spoke shave with a bit more of a curvature to it. That's the only tool I can think of that has a controlled edge like that coming out of the sole uh, that would give you a good result. Hold on a second, I've got to just blow my nose. So let me cut this to length. Um, got a little mark here. I'm going to do something here in a minute that I haven't done in quite a while. And that's asking, do you ever use templates on the shaper for stuff like that? Or are you usually doing one-offs? For stuff like what? The, what we just did? Yeah. Um, I'm usually doing one-offs and usually to be honest with you, the, the shaper would be, I mean the height of what I'm making curved is too much for a, um, a shaper setup. But yeah, if I was doing a bunch, I would probably figure out a way to make it work on the shaper. Um, if you're doing enough of those curved aprons, sure. But there you go. That's pretty nice. I mean, it probably has very slight undulation, just like the period furniture ones would not be perfect, right? I would also want to check it if I was doing a true thing here and check it for square like how is it is it square up the face that's almost let's see this one I would probably want to actually, that's actually pretty good right there so but as you were using your plane you'd want to just double check this and I would take a little more off here, right, right in this area. Pretty good right in here. So you could go that way. I'm not going to fuss with that right now for this effect here. But what I want to do is throw some real traditional method here. And we're going to go with some hide glue. And let's hammer veneer a piece of veneer on there. Right? This has been cooking. Ugh, it always stinks so bad. It's, <laughs> this is rabbit hide. I'm going to just thin it up a touch. It's been, uh, where's my water? It's been cooking for over an hour here. And uh, you, it's kind of a feel thing. It's pretty watery, but I want it a little... almost the consistency like you just want to see it drip nicely off there like that but it's I'm gonna get the brush out and let's just unplug her bring the pot right over to the bench and I'm gonna use this hammer just to squeeze out the air but this is kind of fun because you got instant results so the first thing we'll do is just quickly get it on there as it cools it starts to get jelly like and we don't want that to happen too fast what color rabbit do you use Ron's asking <laughs> what color rabbit no, is that not a <laughs> <Good guys. laughs> Um, the white rabbit of course and then I'm gonna set it on here it doesn't matter if this is cool because it doesn't matter if you get the glue on both sides in fact it helps with the hammering so you put it oh goodness 40 what? lashes on you Ron for catching me <laughs> you know they have a green person here um, Joe's curious, why don't you use the glue pot as a double boiler with the glass jar in the water? I should have, Joe, yeah. I just, I came out and I did not. That's 40 lashes. But yeah, I should. Uh, I, I um, have often used it direct and I didn't even know enough 
until I saw somebody doing that a while ago, and I was like, oh my gosh, I should be doing that. All right, so now I've got the glue in there. Now I'm gonna just start in the middle and drag it out. And you're getting it, it's really creating like a suction. And because you have the high glue on the surface, it, it's like a lubricant and it helps it move really beautifully. And it doesn't hurt the finish. We have some questions about the high glue. Oh, um, I don't, hope I can answer them. I'm not like an uh, expert in this. Go well, ahead. Why, why use high glue besides uh, for the reversibility feature? Why would you choose it? Oh, for fun. Um, to go with the traditional method here. So the brick laying, this is showing you, you don't have to put it in a form if you want to get your veneer on there really quickly. And this, I could have a serpentine front and it would come out just as beautifully and well. I mean, that is, that's on there right now. And then when you sand, that high glue is no problem for the finish. Um, especially shellac. I, I actually should check myself. Does anyone know how high glue reacts with um, like varnishes, like water locks or urethane? I'm not sure if you can go right straight on it. So but, Christopher's curious why you do put it on both sides of the veneer. Why what? You put it on both sides of the veneer. You can't. Oh, um, more for the lubricant factor, and it doesn't hurt. It also acts as a grain filler. So if you wanted to have beautifully filled grain faster, that hide glue goes in there. There's no loose spots on here. If you hear anything, usually you'll hear stuff crackle out. But you'd be able to hear it, but that's on there. So once that's cured, I would then sand it up and I really have something now. Then I true up to the edge and I could bandsaw the back, clean up. I could put veneer in there as well. So this is really old school. We've kind of taken away our bricks from the inside, but this is another method for creating the same curvature. However, a totally different method. No need for building a form, laminating around a form but just making a bunch of little white pine bricks, getting the angle right, pretty enjoyable to create the, the pattern and very fast. And you saw how fast you can clean it up. And if you go with hide glue, I mean, obviously not for every situation, but it's a lot of fun to work with these. I'm gonna go ahead and sand it up and tomorrow and see how it works. With the finish. Would you card scrape versus sanding? Skip's asking. Uh, yeah, you could card scrape, but you, even after card scraping, um, I probably would card scrape a little bit, but um, you still got to sand after card scraping because card scraping is a kind of crushing um, cut. It's not like a, the purity of a hand plane, which even a hand plane a lot of times is going to leave marks that you want to sand out. So I will almost always always finish with sanding and quite often I'm just beginning with 220 because coming right off of a nice uh, scraped surface that's all you need. Can you, Scott's asking, can you use liquid hide glue such as old brown glue with this method? method? Who has that? Scott. Scott, yeah I believe so. I, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that I have not, I have not even used that old brown glue. Um, so, but as I've understood from others who've talked about liquid hide glue in general, that it works quite well. Um, very, it's actually the same. They've just added, uh, some type of, there's an additive that, that keeps it in liquid form at room temperature. So you're able to use it, but, um, so I'm not sure. Somebody else can chime in. What do you think about old brown glue? It would, the question was if it would work the same way, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I Bill's believe. asking, what about making curved panels via cutting curves from the backside? Bill, right? Yeah, sure, Bill. That's another way of doing it. I've never really gone for that method. I mean, unless I'm not with furniture. Um, if I'm doing some kind of edge on a, a counter or something architectural in a house, maybe there, but. There's something about that method. I don't prefer it 
because it can, you have to make sure you get the depth just right and the spacing correct, or else you'll get a, a weird bend. So that's absolutely a, a good method that you can use, but um, I favor the lamination or the standard old school method. Joe says old brown glue is hide glue with urea added to extend the open time and to stay liquid at room temp. Thank you. Joe, it would work the exact same then, I'm assuming. So because you're hammering it out and because it's staying liquid, it, it does cure then. Right, Joe? <laughs> it has to. It gets oh. in there, it's going to bond. Joel's curious how you would apply cock beating on a curved drawer front. Cut the rabbits for the beating, i.e. Um, I actually take the, the shape, like you have a, a template, and you need a wider piece of stock that you've dressed down. And I, if I have a wide enough piece, I can nest all the cuts. So a long drawer like this is you're going to need kind of a wide piece. And so you would prep that material to your thickness and then you can band saw out over size and you're just going to glue those on top and bottom just like the other. I, I wanted to just show you that finished drawer. I'll be right back uh, from last week. Speaking of the cock beating, and you can see that this drawer, I didn't sand it, but you can see how nice that ended up when I got that in all around. So it's a pretty sweet little detail. But when you do it on a curved drawer, it looks really dynamite too. Um, but yeah, it would be exactly that, that approach. And wouldn't that be something though with, I love this Cuban mahogany veneer and this would be spectacular on a, as an apron or drawer fronts. And I've used it numerous times on other pieces, but that is one of the most beautiful veneers I've ever had. And I've got a nice little stash that I'll probably never go through. Um, how would you cut a tenon? Tony's asking, how would you cut a tenon as opposed to a sliding tenon? Did you cover Dennis's question? Oh yeah, thanks. Um, that was Joe? Well, we have two things going on. Remember Dennis's question about how you yeah. attach the legs, and then Tony's asking, how would you cut a tenon as opposed to a sliding tenon? Yeah, Joe, I, I wouldn't cut a tenon. Um, I, I would rather have... There's no Joe, hun. Dennis and Tony. <laughs> Tony, I'm sorry, Tony. I was speaking to Tony second, and I'll come yeah. back to Dennis. I would, I would do it this way with a... a a loose tenon, it's not really loose once it's glued in, but a floating tenon, whatever you want to call it. For me, it's definitely the way to go on this kind of thing because to cut a, obviously, to cut a tenon on a piece like this, the geometry is pretty hard on a table saw. The way I would cut it is with an end mill, if you have an end mill um, of some sort. There are other, there are these modern tools out there that um, I'm not sure if the Panto router will do it, but there's the multi-router that, um, that uh, let's see, Woodpeckers bought multi-router, and they're going to be selling those if they're not already. But that's another end mill where you'll have a, like a high-speed router comes in from the end, and it would leave the tenon there. That would simplify the whole thing, right? But... For, for me, if without those kind of more advanced routing techniques, I would just cut it to the correct length. And I do that by sitting it on a little a sled that has a stem up in the middle that holds it in the center. And I'll make my cross cut on each end because the ends are elevated a little bit and they're supported. I'll show you that whole thing when we get to cross cut. But I make those two cross cuts by turning it around on the center line so you've got the exact height and length you want. Then the key to floating tenons in this way is just to set up the end so it's perpendicular to whatever floating ten tenon method you're using. Whether it's a domino, or uh, this is from a wing cutter, a quarter inch wing cutter, or you could even use a biscuit cutter if it's wide enough. But you just have to make sure that's setting your floating tenon in 90 degrees to that whatever angle that surface is. That's why floating tenons, I think, are 
an awesome way to go on curved projects. So it takes all of the complexity out. So you're, you're cutting the ends to the proper, that's the angle on the curved piece. That's complex enough, right? And then you get your floating tenon perpendicular to that surface. So that when you get a table, like say one like this, all done, then, and that has the slot for the same floating tenons, that's cut perpendicular. You know that's going in. That joint is going to be perfect. It doesn't have any guesswork to it because the other tenon, the other mortise, is cut perpendicular to this surface. So you know the shoulder is going to go in and be just perfectly aligned like that. How do they do it old school? Tony's curious. <laughs> Man, I don't know, Tony. I gotta think about that. I don't know. I'm gonna have to think about that. Do I have to wipe my nose? <laughs> you wiping your nose. I was like, do I have to wipe my nose? <laughs> I don't know. Does anybody know how they did it? Old school? Um, I know we. I you'd see a lot of glue blocks. Like the ends, the inside would have always a glue block in there. Um, I guess maybe they did have a way of uh, creating the tenon on there. But if you do make it up out of bending ply like this, one of the nice advantages too is that if you remember the structure of the bending ply, all the grain is running this way because it's flexible. It's end grain on the top and bottom. So that actually on the end, the edge of that, that bending ply, it's side grain. So rather than an end grain to end grain joint, you're getting a side grain glue joint, which is quite unusual when you come in here. So you're getting the, the strength of the tenons and the side grain right in there. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out about that. Um, that's a great question. I haven't had to deal with that. I'm always thinking about it in terms of modern methods. But traditionally, you're going to always see glue blocks but what's on there internally? I'm guessing it probably is a true tenon. But and they Dennis were smarter than us. And question about attaching the legs. Is that, did you just answer that? Attaching the legs? Attaching them? Attaching the, to the leg? I'm sorry. Whatever Dennis asked you earlier. Yeah. He was asking about the floating tenon, I think. Okay. So, which we just talked about. So, and then I use a pocket hole technique, which I've shown on a, a number of other things with that perpendicular... And so I use it also in the inside here, so you get that pocket inside the curved, and you see the different layers. A lot of times I'll come in here and I'll just color that if I don't want to see it, and you can even put veneer over the bottom edge if you don't want to see that there as well. I think there's some suggestions about old school. Scribe and knife tenon, Jeff says. Yeah, you'd, right, you'd have to mark it out. Like, that. that's the way, if you ask me to do it, that's what I would do. I would, I would, you have to get the correct angle across the top and bottom, and you'd mark it out very accurately, almost like any kind of uh, standard tenon on, in, that you're going to hand cut. And once you get it in there with, the, with a nice shoulder plane, you can adjust and true it up at the end anyway. You're going to make sure, though, like any good joinery, hand cut joinery, you're going to have to have the layout has to be dead on. And then you're gonna, then you just cut to the line. It's that simple. Yeah, there's some suggestions. I'll have to make sure Tom reads them. Uh, Michael's, Mike's asking, have you steam bent solid wood for such a table apron? No lamination? No, Michael, I, as I was saying at the beginning, I don't do a lot of steam bending. I've done it in a few small situations, but I'm not a big steam bender. I mean, where you see steam bending mostly are in more um, uh, chair making. So like Windsor's and folk chairs and you know that type of country chairs where you can have more bends. There are There is higher scale furniture that is made that way, but it's not as common. It's um, usually you're gonna see uh, lamination or something like that. Mass production, uh, you see a lot of quick chairs made with bent elements. Um, who was famous for it? Uh, Hans Wagner 
had some classic, well, the classic chair is most famous. Some of those elements on there are steam bent. That's a gorgeous, elegant chair, but that's something I need to get a little more into here and there. I know I will because I've got a shaker rocker to do and there's some sweet bent elements and then the slats on the back. You always see those are gonna be uh, steam bent as well. So we'll be doing some of that when we do that project, that authentic shaker rocker actually it is. <laughs> so, wow. So we covered a lot of ground as far as uh, getting into the technique of the bow front apron and we will definitely be revisiting this in other cases especially when we dive deep on some particular project so we'd be able to go into a lot of these aspects in other ways but it was kind of fun to talk about the different methods using um, bending ply solid wood over form or even brick laying up your piece and putting on your veneer old school that's pretty sweet all right thank you so much for joining us tonight i had a great time and it's always better when someone is hanging out in the shop to chit chat with and so on behalf of the camera lady and myself we will see you next time remember to like share and subscribe and all that we'll see you next time on right back here on shop night live <laughs> good night everybody good night everyone <laughs> thanks for joining us see you next time <laughs>